it looks like we're good to go in live. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. Super excited to be here today with my friend, Dr. Anna Kabaka, and she has written some bestsellers. I'm going to introduce her formally, but if you want to find other episodes of Dr. Jill Live, you can find us on YouTube. You can find me at drjillcarnahan.com um, or Jill, drjillhealth.com. But for today, let's get to our guest. I'm so excited. Uh, Dr. Anna and I have been running around in similar circles for so long. And recently, she was kind enough to interview me on her platform. And I wanted to bring her here today just to talk about menopause. And so many of you out there um, are dealing with symptoms in this phase. And it could be perimenopause several years before you've actually hit the pause. It could be right in between in the midst of the chaos. Or it could be years after and you still might be struggling with symptoms. And we're going to dive deep with Dr. Anna and talk about symptom control, what to eat, what, how to sleep better, all those kinds of things that might be on your mind. Um, I'm going to be focused on Anna, but if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. And I will also try to keep an eye on those and uh, answer those as we go. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Anna Kabaka. She is a DO and ob and a best-selling author of The Hormone Fix, Keto Green 16, and Menu Pause, her latest. Dr. Anne is a triple board certified and fellow of gynecology and obstetrics, integrative medicine, and anti-aging and regenerative medicine. She holds special certifications in functional medicine, sexual health, and bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. She lectures frequently on those topics throughout the world to large audiences and is known nationally as the Girlfriend Doctor and host of The Girlfriend Doctor show. She has personally developed natural products to help women balance hormones and thrive through menopause, including the highly acclaimed Julva cream for the vulva and mighty maca plus a powerful superfood blend. We'll talk about those and other things. She now lives in Dallas with her daughters, horses, and dogs. And I remember and at some of those shows where we talked and shared and your beautiful, beautiful daughters are together there with you. And I always just thought how amazing that you can do your work and do what you love. And your family is right there alongside you. So I've seen that in action. Welcome tonight. Oh my gosh, it's great here to be here with you. And I love everything that you're doing and sharing and the heart you do it with, Jill. So thank you for having me. You are welcome. I feel the same about you. I know we're like sisters from another mother or something, right? Because it's like so <laughs> aligned. Um, I always, I mean, you know, you just recognize when people are out there authentically really doing what they love and really with a heart of service. And you're one of those. Um, I love to start with a little backstory as far as how did you get into medicine and then how did you get into especially integrative and functional medicine? Tell us a little bit about your journey. Yeah, you know, it's so funny, Jill, because when I was little, like I was six years old and I would tell my mom, I want to be a, a, a ballerina, a nun or a doctor, a physician. <laughs> and I would say that I became a physician by default. <laughs> I love I couldn't it. become the other two things. Right. <laughs> so, so it was, it was really from a young age that I knew I wanted to, to go into medicine. And partly as a young girl, I had ear surgeries over and over again. And then my mom, I saw her in and out of the hospital. And, and when I was 16, she was undergoing heart surgery for cardiac bypass surgery due to, you know, hardening of the artery, arteries, coronary vascular disease. And and I recognized at that time that the research they were basing her surgery on was done primarily on men. And I'm like, it's got, there's got to be a difference, right? There's got to be a difference. So I became really passionate about women's health. And that what that's what led me into gynecology and obstetrics. Wow. And clearly before your integrative functional, did you do, did you practice and deliver babies and the whole works, right? You had the full. Yes. What yeah, so because yeah, tell me because the traditional route I went the same way, right? And um, either we, when we're in that route, we see oh, there's more. Like, where are the answers for these complex chronic things? Or we kind of have an idea before we go into medicine, what else we want to do? What was your journey like? Yes, so it's been like little little steps, right? Often there are little seeds before you get the kick in the ass, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> So knowing that, you know, understanding with my mom, when I was in residency, my mom passed away undergoing her second heart surgery at the young age of 67. Wow. I had just had my, my firstborn daughter and I just been 30 years old, just turned 30. And I, she, um, you know, and I lost the, like, essentially my heart, my mom was my heart, my best friend, my confidant, my, you know, like second, mm -hmm. second half, essentially in my life. And, and it was devastating. And I started asking why, 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 but you know, when you're in residency, you're, 
um, you know, it's brutal. 90 <laughs> miles an hour, you're yeah. going nonstop, you know, sleepless, we worked 80 hours a week to 100 hours a week yeah. in ubi Gin. And it was I mean, it's a lot. And so when I started in private practice, and then my daughter, uh, my firstborn daughter was having attention issues, right. And I was blessed, I would uh, dug into hormone therapy, I was already sitting in backup conference rooms and, you know, um, attending lectures and learning these things. And, and when my daughter was uh, very young, I was uh, in the back of a hormone conference room seated next to a Dr. Gustafson out of Atlanta. And, you know, we were talking about ADD and she introduced me to functional medicine. So it was in it was like maybe early 2000 that I got introduced to functional medicine for attention deficit mm -hmm. disorder, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And I started learning and it just made so much yeah. sense. Like, first of all, take away the stimulants yeah. in their food and their drinks and their, you know, take away those stimulants, let their nervous system calm down. And, and, you know, then it made sense too, because in labor with her, yeah. I was in labor for three days. Oh, wow. the, there was a bomb threat in Atlanta during the Olympics. She was born in 1996. If you all remember the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, there was a bomb threat. I was in that hospital and everyone was like a lot, you know, the majority of people were evacuated, but those of us who were actively in labor yeah. were not. So we were, you know, there's bomb threat, you're yeah. in labor, can't go anywhere should be okay. Right. Yeah. And it was, thank God. So I had that. And then, you know, she and I both got an infection. So long drawn out labor infection, high stress. And so she was on antibiotics for her first 10 days of her life, wow. IV antibiotics. And like, if you, like, I didn't know then what I know now, but I know now how that destroyed her gut microbiome. And I could figure out the pieces, you know, in retrospect, and so that really helped me become an advocate for my mom's, my pregnant moms and, um, you know, and, and then for myself and then my own journey with early menopause at 39 mm. and irreversible, you know, infertility diagnosis, I was told the only option for me would be egg donation. And that was devastation on devastation. Yeah. And so that, um, took me further. Every step took me into integrative medicine, functional medicine, and that took me further and further. And as a result of world medicine, food as medicine, Eastern, Western combined medicine, reversed the early menopause diagnosis and naturally conceived and at 41 delivered my youngest baby girl. Yeah. What an amazing story. And there's so many threads that are so common. First of all, that we reach the end of like what we're traditionally taught in medicine. There's wonderful things there. We still both use that, but there's always these like limitations with chronic complex illness or ADHD or fertility or menopause even. And what we realize is like, oh, what we were taught in medical school only goes so far. Or I say our toolbox is only this big. It's wonderful for a starter kit, right? <laughs> but then like, do we have to expand and add to that? And usually it comes from either our own experience or that of our loved ones and your journey is no different. So how awesome that you got in, you know, integrated and then all the education that you got since then. And now you are really, really helping women and it's so needed. So tell us, um, I am uh, similar to you fairly early menopausal kinds of symptoms and stuff, but so many women out there um, are trying to figure out, you know, how to get through this change. Where do you start if someone comes in to ask you questions, you know, maybe starting to have symptoms, maybe still cycling, maybe starting to get irregular in that perimenopause where there's not quite fully into it. What questions do you ask and how do you start with that approach? Yeah. So when a patient comes in with those early menopausal symptoms, I mean, seriously, whenever there's a problem with your period, your period is a vital sign. It really is a vital sign. And I think that's something that we miss in gynecology and obstetrics. We just assume all, per all periods are created equal. Yeah. The color of the blood, the frequency, the thickness, the viscosity, all of these things, um, matter. And they tell you something about what's going on in your body and, and traditional Chinese medicine, they've known that a long time, right? They know that a long time. They ask you, what color is your menstrual blood? I mean, it's really fasting. Do you spot before spot after? I mean, these are pieces that tell us a little bit something what's going on with your hormone balance. 
what's going on with inflammation, what's going on with your nutritional level, you know? And so those are pieces that um, that's important. And so I look at this and say, if a patient's coming in early perimenopause menopause from the gynecologic standpoint, how regular are your cycles are irregular? Are you breakthrough bleeding? How heavy are there? What does that, what does that look like? How has that changed over the years? So that's part of it. That's the GYN side, right? Mm -hmm. And the, that's the endocrine side, the neuro neurologic side, the neuroendocrine side is, you know, the PMS symptoms. Are you moody or is it, are you feeling more tense the week before your period? Are you sleeping less or sleeping more? Do you, how's your energy level? If you only hate your husband two weeks out of the month, it's probably yeah. your hormones more so than <laughs> your husband, you know, if it's only two weeks. Right. And so like, those are like physiology affects our behavior. So that tells me, and you know, it's so fascinating Jill, because, you know, I learned the end you know, I learned endocrinology, all the pathways, you know, as an OBGYN resident at Emory University, the thing I didn't learn, it was the connection to the neurotransmitters, the connection to of estrogen to serotonin or testosterone to dopamine and progesterone to GABA. I didn't learn those things, but when I did, I could see it everywhere in the way the symptoms manifest. And that was powerful to me because then I knew, look, you're not going crazy. Yeah. You know, you're, you're like, let's, let's address this. Let's address the physiology, decrease the information and decrease the inflammation, balance the hormones and support the adrenal glands. And we've got 99% of it taken care of. Okay. I love that. Um, let's walk through like, again, a classical, now everybody's different. As you said, I see the same thing and we really need to individualize, but kind of some of the basics that are common to most women in the cycle. Typically we see, is it progesterone goes down first? And then we see later the estrogen and walk us through kind of what might happen and what women could do kind of in the very beginning, um, when they're still cycling and then when they stop cycling and, and maybe what to look for just a few little tips or pearls in the journey. Yes, definitely. So like in our, in our mid, you know, our late twenties to mid thirties, our DHEA starts to decline a little bit. And that's the precursor to estrogen and testosterone. So the first thing you need to know is that you've got to keep supporting your adrenal glands. And we do that best by, um, by stress management. Actually, I always say increasing oxytocin, the most powerful hormone of our body, because that will increase heart rate variability. And that decreases stress and improves the, you know, improves your body's natural production of DHEA when you're not having to lose the pre, you know, lose your hormones to cortisol. Yes. So that's in your, in our late twenties, thirties, start really identifying what's most important to you. And that, that self care, that way to bounce back and create resilience that's in your twenties to thirties. Now in your mid thirties, progesterone starts plummeting. And that is the precursor hormone progesterone and pregnenolone are mother hormones. And when we are stressed, they're going to shunt to the creation of cortisol. So, and your audience well knows this because it's so key you know, that's a key component of stress. So you add now this decline in progesterone and our clients show up with PMS, irregular cycles, heavier than normal periods, uh, breakthrough bleeding. All of these symptoms start because of that progesterone insufficiency. We say estrogen dominance, but we want to focus on progesterone, progesterone insufficiency. Because why? Because progesterone is a neuroprotective hormone. As we lose these precursor hormones, our body's ability to metabolize or to make Glucose is even impaired in the brain and in the muscle, in the heart muscle. And so we start to, we see this decline and um, in, we see this increase in these neurologic symptoms as a result of this declining um, progesterone level. And so what do we do? We want to improve progesterone. Again, it comes to, I would say oxyplay, right? Increase yeah. oxytocin, decrease cortisol manage that. And it comes to decreasing inflammation because our body will produce cortisol again to take care of inflammation. And if we're do, making more cortisol for, you know, it's necessary, but like if we can, if we're making more cortisol, we're going to deplete progesterone even more. Mm -hmm. So we want to address that and support the adrenal glands. So that's where I use adaptogens. I will start my clients on, you know, modified elimination diet. I call it my keto green detox. And I would start them on my adaptogenic blend, which is my mighty maca plus or something similar. And I, um, 
and to help support them during this time. And we see an improvement by doing that in DHEA and progesterone levels. So that's like clinically evident. So we see that quick shift and we're basically turning back the hands of time. And that's so powerful. And then as our hormones continue to decline, we see a decline in estrogen and testosterone. So we feel the symptoms, the clients will say, I, I've lost my edge. Yeah. I, you know, there's that one, you know, I, I love my husband. I don't feel love for him or, you know, he's pissing me off. So it can be both those ways <laughs> and um, the mood swings, the irritability, you know, all of that can be rearing its ugly head, but also the weight gain without doing anything different. And that's because our body is becoming more insulin resistant as we age. And so that's where like the keto green approach comes in to create insulin sensitivity, to manage cortisol and to increase oxytocin. So those are simple things. And then our 50s, 60s with the, uh, the hot flashes, yeah. right? So supporting the adrenals, becoming more insulin sensitive, decreases hot flashes significantly. And so that's how I would help with that transition time period. And then, then we're supporting natural, healthy ovarian function. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme, or Epstein-Barr, and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. I'll say what a beautiful like synopsis. And what you mentioned too is so important. The neurotransmitters, the brain health, right? The heart health, like all these other organs have receptors for hormones as well. And sometimes we get focused, especially in our medical minded narrowness of just the ovaries and the uh, endometrium and the breast tissue, but it's so much bigger than that. And I love that you, and I also really appreciated the talk about stress because stress is the enemy of cortisol. And then it draws on all of our other hormones. It's kind of like this weight that's pulling everything else down. Right. So you address that. So let's talk about the average woman, maybe late forties, early fifties, where they just stopped having cycles. They've actually just maybe gone a year, which is our medical definition of menopause. They're just in menopause. Um, are you typically doing hormones? Do you start with just the diet, the lifestyle before you do hormones? What kind of order operations would you do for someone who's truly in menopause and wanting to optimize their health and wellness? Yeah. So it's always like, it's a stepwise approach, mm -hmm. but if you do everything at one time, you're not feeling wow. like, you know, there's a certain amount we can do everything at one time, but it really works better as we do control. So the first thing, like if a patient comes into my office, she's in this early menopause, I'm going to draw lab work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put her on a detox program and I know I've got to support her adrenal. So tip my two key supplements are an omega-3, a very high quality omega-3 fish oil and a, a mighty maca plus. So I usually start there. Then I'll come back and review their labs. Now I know they're going to need progesterone over 50, over 55, definitely over 60. I want a transdermal progesterone on board. And so then I'll use the balance cream, progesterone and pregnenolone or prescribe uh, our oral progesterone or a, a stronger concentration. But I know um, beyond menopause, we definitely need a transdermal. I like the safest way is transdermal. So as much as possible, transdermal. So perimenopause to beyond. Mm -hmm. And I'll do, I'll do that and then add in DHEA, estrogen and testosterone. So I'd like to start top down and see how it goes. And then I would follow up in three or four months with urinary hormone analysis, mm -hmm. like the Dutch test. So I'd follow up with something like that. And then again, further evaluate their nutrients, their mitochondrial fun function and their nutrients. So in a very um, stepwise fashion, because I used to do, okay, I'm going to do all this and yeah. then throw all this at you. And you're like, 
You know, I love that approach because so many docs, even some of our education that we've been taught is this all in one formula that has everything in it, right? You, you know who I'm talking about in some of the, the training. I don't like that either because they do well or don't, and you don't really, it's like adjusting five levers and you don't really know which one is doing what. I mean, we know what they should do, but we don't know in that person, individual. So I really, really like that approach. Um, you mentioned oxytocin, uh, love this hormone. Tell us a little bit more about what that does and how we can raise our oxytocin. Oh my goodness. Well, one part of my own journey was from trauma and burnout and PTSD. Well, the PTSD caused um, burnout and it caused my, you know, definitely a PTSD of the puzzle to my divorce, where I was, I know I love my husband, I don't feel love for my husband, right, that disconnect. And, um, and I really had to dig deep and say, well, what has caused this? Where is this coming from? Why, you know, like, you know, intellectually, it didn't make sense. And um, I recognize that when cortisol goes up, oxytocin goes down, right? You can't be stressed and love your enemy, right? right. <laughs> so physiologically, yeah. not a, it doesn't work. And so, but when cortisol is up for a long time, the paraventricular nucleus in the brain suppresses cortisol. So you're in this dangerous state where cortisol and um, oxytocin are both low. And that's that burnout. That's the physiology of divorce. That's the physiology of quitting your job that you used to love. That's the physiology of depression and isolation. And, um, and it's real. And also recognize that where cortisol is the most um, acidifying hormone in our body, you have stress, your urine pH is going to be very acidic because cortisol increases hydrogen ion secretion across the renal tubules. All that to say it becomes like peeing acid. We don't want to pee acid. It's not good for us. And how, on the contrary, this whole seesaw, seesaw, oxytocin is the most alkalinizing. You have fun with your friends, you laugh, you're playing, you're like taking a hike in nature, enjoying yourself. Yeah, that's the most alkaline. Your urine pH becomes very alkaline. I mean, that's so crazy, right? It's so crazy, but oxytocin is the most reparative hormone. It's the longevity hormone. It rebuilds even muscles in our, you know, in, in the elderly. I don't know when I'm going to be elderly. I'm never going to be elderly, yeah. but you know, like it, it repairs our old muscle and oxytocin is this hormone of connection, of laughter, of love, of joy. And to know that that empowers your body in the Bible, it says in, um, you know, Philippians 4, 13, probably one of the best known verses, it's focus on what is, I'm going to butcher it, focus on what is good, what is lovely, what you, you know, what is true. Yes. (laughs) Good rapport. So that is focusing on the positive. So retraining your mind and being grateful. And when you are, you increase your oxytocin. So that helps you oppose this underlying and this current of cord- cortisol. And when you've had PTSD, when you've had adverse childhood events, your body's trained to produce this cortisol. So you have to retrain it. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. And love those things. I mean, really same thing with me when I've, you know, gone through all kinds of difficulties in the last decades and that finding joy, finding friendships, play, playing, coloring, <laughs> all these things are like so powerful connection. And we just, we really need that. Um, a couple of just random questions. First of all, um, Julva. So I want to talk about women, vaginal dryness. So often women after menopause, I hear this complaint all day long in my clinic of vaginal dryness, low libido. And I want to specifically highlight your product because I think it's so well formulated to tell us about vaginal dryness and yeah, perfect. And what you've got, because I think this is such a great product. We have it in our store here and love it. And Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it too. Jolva came about because I was always, I, from 1999, I started compounding hormones for clients, especially my clients with breast cancer to figure out what I could do safely for them. Right. And DHEA and testosterone both had really good research. Mm -hmm. When I closed my practice and my patients were like, Dr. Anna, no one will give us your compound. So I committed to them. It was like, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, and yeah. I, you know, you don't sometimes know how on the edge you are, how on right. the edge you are <laughs> until like, what, what do you mean? And like, no one knew how to compound yeah. anyway. So, um, I, uh, I said, I, I committed to my patients. I'm going to come up with a formula that's even better than anything I could write on a prescription, safer, more effective, and, you know, in a clean product, and it's yeah. going to be less expensive. So that was my commitment to my patients. And it took me three years and a lot of testing. And I came up with Jolva. I'd already known of the DHEA research. 
And plant stem cell research was really powerful in early 2000s. I mean, you know, it was just coming to 2010, even it was just coming to the surface. So incorporating stem cells in skincare was important. I wanted a cosmetic. If you don't have to put it in your vagina, like I would say, if it doesn't bring you pleasure, don't put, you know, have to put it in your vagina. So as far as suppository and tablets and all those things can be a problem. And they were for me and I, you know, I'd, I'd struggled with this issue and incontinence issue. So, Mm -hmm. so DHEA plant stem cells, and then emu oil, coconut oil, and shea butter. So such a clean product. That's one thing I love about what you did is because there's so many things out there that are out there that work, but they are filled with parabens and things that are toxic and endocrine disruptors, right? Like those things actually disrupt our own hormones. You mentioned this in your formulation and because Personally, I'm a breast cancer survivor now, 21 years. So I've always had to be a little cautious with hormones. My history is just that estrogen dominance, massive cortisol, massive estrogen. Well, now I'm, I'm more on the other side of that. And I've done the research and do, but what would you do with somebody who has had breast cancer, especially maybe distant like me, would you still avoid, I mean, obviously we know progesterone. I just love a little take on, on how you would treat someone. Cause it's so common now that I'm sure a lot of women who have had breast cancer come to you. What's, yeah. what's safe to do? Well, I think that's been my, that that was a love of my practice. And I was referral for a lot of clients that weren't being helped with breast cancer. And so I was able to see clients as early as 1999, followed through with compounding hormones till today and have seen them do really, really well. The first, you know, so I would say like in this instance, this is the research behind DHEA and breast cancer is very favorable, Mm -hmm. very favorable. It can fact can have a protective effect. Each individual is different. I need to know where your hormones are going. So someone with a diagnosis of breast cancer, we like, okay, well, we've got, you know, safety with DHEA, with testosterone, we've got these even progesterone and transdermal estrogen, we've got safety profiles, but each individual is different. So I was, I would monitor, I feel very comfortable with using Jolva. I would monitor um, inflammatory markers and I would do the lifestyle, the keto green, because what do we know that's going to decrease risk more is being more insulin sensitive and keeping inflammation at bay. But research looking specifically at DHEA and breast allograft tissue showed a favorable effect and no increase in you know, in breast cancer, in metastasis or morbidity and mortality, in fact, decreased morbidity. And so I think that's, that for me is so powerful because every woman deserves to have a life after breast cancer, not just be happy you're alive, just waiting for the next shoe to drop and you can't have sex, you have dryness, you tear, you're, you know, you have incontinence issues and same with it, the anal tissue becomes friable. I mean, the clitoris to anus, the most important real estate of our body and we have to take care of it. And I think many women who have had GYN cancers aren't even, you know, I mean, I, you know, and they've had hysterectomies for uterine cancer, for instance, and they're not offered estrogen. It's really, it's, it's tragic. And the recent New York times article that was published the first of February was entitled misled about menopause. And it was a really great review. I really recommend that I did a, um, I did a a YouTube video about that. And I always say we need to breeze through menopause into the second spring of our life and the quality of our life matters. The quality of our life matters. And so I felt safe producing this. And um, if someone is undergoing current treatment for breast cancer, talk to their oncologist, you know, that's not the time to, to sway, yes. but once your treatment's completed mm-hmm. and you, you need to really look at what options improve your quality of life, but do it in a balanced way. I feel the same way about progesterone cream, often a progesterone insufficiency or deficiency yes. or estrogen dominance, increase the risk of breast cancer, whether it's from hormones that we produced endogenously, or, you know, probably like in your case, you know, hormone mimickers, endocrine right. disruptors that that affected your body's own natural ability. So using bioidentical progesterone, many times over and over again, my patients would say, Dr. Ann, I feel like a cloud has lifted. And I will tell you this from being in practice and seeing patients over 20 years, that patients would, the patients that I diagnosed with breast cancer were either on synthetic hormones or on birth control pills for an extended amount of time or nothing, not the ones who were managed with bioidentical hormones. 
What a, this is such valuable information. And I love, I really, really agree on every point. And again, as a survivor, I've taken a special interest in this. So um, I think your cream is phenomenal. And again, you always want to check with the oncologist after, like you said, the treatment. And what you said too is important is I'll, we'll follow the actual metabolite. So we both look into what are you doing with these hormones? Because we can follow, if you're making some nasty metabolites that are damaging to DNA, then we need to intervene and do what we can to help you metabolize them appropriately. But that's part of the process. And um, I love that you bring the light to that because one of the things 20 years ago that they did not talk about was quality of life. And again, I remember at 25 getting breast cancer and thinking about, you know, will I have fertility? Will I, all these different things. I literally went into premature menopause at 25 for two years after the chemo. I thought my ovaries were done. Well, they kicked in and I it ended up cycling for another decade or so, but it was pretty crazy because at 25, I remember being in the car in the middle of winter and being like, turn on the air conditioner. I, like it was so dramatic. And I realized in my twenties, like what these women that typically in their fifties were experiencing. And I had such a respect back then for menopause because I thought oh, it's not light. It's not for the lightweight, right? Like it's serious business and it was miserable. And I literally had every menopause symptom you could mention for two years in my twenties. So I know what it's like. I do. And thank goodness my ovaries kicked back in somehow they were able to revive themselves. Um, what great information. Um, what's some, we didn't talk a lot about uh, lifestyle or diet and, and we just have a few minutes left, but what would, this is so core to you, what you do. And I know your new cookbook menu pause, tell us just a bit about like a basic outline of, of kind of a diet that's ideal for women in their forties and fifties and beyond. Yeah. So for me, it's with intermittent, like for me and my client base, it's intermittent fasting is a must and breaking fast with a good keto green meal. So high quality protein, healthy fats, very low carb, but the carbs we choose are like your, your sprouted vegetables, your cruciferous vegetables, your kimchi and sauerkraut fermented food. So you want to make sure that we're always feeding the gut microbiome. So, but a high quality protein, healthy fats, and you're not going to be hungry as your body gets used to this. No more snacking. And a second meal, you know, you know, like two or three meals a day, no more snacking, 13 to 16 hour fasting on a regular basis, eat dinner before seven. So that's like, again, more, I didn't even really, you know, that is more about pattern and lifestyle than it is about the actual food. And the, uh, the food we eat, though, for example, steak and vegetables, salmon and um, capers and tomatoes. I love smoked salmon, capers, tomatoes, red onions, drizzled with olive oil and a side of avocado. Yeah, Those are keto <laughs> green meals, right? Yeah. You're just leaving yeah. out, you're leaving out the starches. Yeah. And, and, and that, that really does help with glucose control. And so, and this was so interesting. Uh, a side note, Jill, when I started my magic menopause online program, that's my eight week course. When I started that, you know, I, I started working with clients and, you know, we wanted energy, weight management, and what they were telling me over and over again was their hot flashes were gone. I'm like, wait, I'm not giving you hormones. Like, how is your hot flashes gone? And so I dug, I'm like, insulin must have something to do with it. And I, I didn't know that. So I dug into the research and absolutely insulin resistant is a cause for unrelenting hot flashes. And so once they create this insulin sensitivity, the hot flashes are gone. So I would say that's true in over 90% of, of people with unrelenting hot flashes. Then mm. there's a portion, like we've just got to add some hormone in. We've just got to give you some hormone back and that will make a difference. So those few things, um, I think are, are part oh. of it. So that's the keto green lifestyle. And we have a free 10 day, um, breeze through menopause, the keto green way. And that is our breeze through menopause program. So we'll give you the link for that. Perfect. We will be sure. So I also want to get a link to that YouTube you did on the article in New York times. So we will be sure and share that if you guys want to hear more, um, so where can uh, people find you, Dr. Anna? Where can they get their resources and uh, all your great products and services and your books, especially the Hormone Fix, which I think was the bestseller? Um, tell us a little bit about where your products and services, where we can find you. Yeah, thank you. So um, my website is dranna.com, D-R-A-N-N-A.com. And I'm on social media at The Girlfriend Doctor. So, and you can get my books anywhere books are sold and there's um, book resource pages on my website, come back to, because we just put in your book receipt number and we give you extra, extra book bonuses that are just amazing. So awesome. Thank you for all the work that you do in the world. And just last bit of advice, the menopause is a woman out there who's discouraged fighting with her husband, <laughs> whatever else is going on. Um, what, what last bit of wisdom would you like to leave our audience with? 
that really it is that there's the pauses in our life where the magic lies. So whether it's menopause, whether it's whatever, it is the pauses in our life. So I would say take pause, take inventory, what's really important to you. And if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. And take just one next right step. There is hope to be better tomorrow. Doesn't matter how long you've been dealing with an illness. There is there is hope to be better tomorrow. So I want to encourage that was everyone. like 20 pearls in one. I love it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. No, oh my God. You and I both like we cannot like it's just, I know. I know it's so I gotta good. tell you everything. I just want to share as much as possible with you. Wow. I want you better quicker, right? Like that's our absolutely, thing. Absolutely, like, absolutely. And uh, thank you for your platform, for all you do for the world, for all the love and light that you bring most of all, for your beautiful family. You are a gift. And um, thank you again for your time today. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Jill. You're welcome.